Point Lookout has some fantastic quests, many of which we've already covered so far in this series. But what makes this DLC so enjoyable is the moody, dangerous, and continually interesting landscape. Bethesda didn't just give us two or three quests with this DLC, they created a new zone, filled with its own people, its own histories, and a lot of other minor locations to discover and loot. In this video, we are going to cover every other minor location not associated with a quest before we wrap up this series with the Dark Heart of Black Hall. The first site we'll visit today is one of my favorites. The Jet Crash Site lies along the northwestern border of the map. We see it stand out from a distance because one of the trees in this area does not look like the others. As we approach, we see that a parachute has become lodged in this tree. As we get close to explore, we get rushed by feral ghouls. The chute itself is stuck at the very top of the tree, but the owner of this parachute is not far away. On the ground, we see a combat helmet next to an assault rifle, and hanging out of the tree is the skeleton of a man, likely a man who jumped from the sky and accidentally crashed directly into this tree. It's interesting that near this tree there is an axe. A large axe like this is usually not issued to military pilots. The reason he fell from the sky becomes plain as we walk southwest from this tree. Here we find the jet crash site. Around the site, we also see more of these axes. On the ground near the left wing are a whole bunch of corpses. The bodies also have shovels, and there's a pile of scraps scattered around the ground. We find an average locked footlocker. Inside, we find a pistol and a small stash of caps. There is another skeleton near to this footlocker, and this fellow is surrounded by another combat helmet, a 10mm pistol, four boxes of 10mm ammunition, a buff out, a first aid kit on the wing by his head, and a black box recorder. Once we activate the black box recorder, it makes a ham radio sound, but then it opens up like a container. Inside, we find a conductor, a fission battery, and the black box recording. Aircom, we have multiple flashpoints on horizon. Come back. Air Command, USN-350 requesting landing vector. Have zero ceiling visibility and low on state. Somebody get me a landing clearance. State 1 plus 1, 0 to splash. Have zero read on outer marker. This is USN-350. I'm blind out here. Attempting emergency landing over water. INS pinger active on distress band. Flaps up, descent to eight cherubs. Three green over. Five cherubs, tree line up. Throttle easy on four lights. Prepping to pull the loud handle. Now I know absolutely nothing about airplanes or being a pilot, so I'm not even going to attempt to tell you what kind of plane this is, or if what we heard on that recording is something a pilot would really say. But it sounds convincing enough to me, and it tells us almost everything we need to know. They saw multiple flashpoints on the horizon that is likely the detonations of China's nuclear bombs all the way in Washington, D.C. We remember from Point Lookout lore that Point Lookout itself was not directly hit with an atomic bomb, but we find the place in the stage that it is due to toxins that washed ashore and seeped up from the waters below. We also don't know what runway this guy was trying to reach. We don't find one here in Point Lookout. Perhaps he was aiming for an aircraft carrier, and it's clear that he completely missed the water, which was where he was trying to land. But the thing I want to point out here is that the cockpit is very small. In the cockpit, we found an ammo box, and it looks like there's only room for one. The pilot is likely the skeleton of the man we found hanging in the tree. But what about all of these other skeletons? Well, I think we find a few clues here that can piece everything together. We find axes and shovels all strewn about. Personal footlockers and boxes have been removed from the plane, as has the black box. We've learned elsewhere from the Point Lookout DLC that the locals, even before the war, were extremely violent. I believe what may have happened is that this plane crash landed here. The pilot got stuck in the tree. My bet is that the locals raced to this wreckage, murdered the pilot as he was struggling in the tree, which is why we find that axe there, and then tried to pull as much as they could from the wreckage. They either began to argue amongst each other about the loot, and then killed each other in a fight, or perhaps the radiation from the crash killed them, or, and I think this may be the most likely one, 
the nuclear fallout from the blasts in DC finally reached these guys, whereupon it killed them. Now I know Point Lookout is a long way away from Washington DC. As far as I know, none of the atomic bombs ever detonated in the real world would have that kind of blast radius and nuclear fallout may not reach this far. But we're talking about a different universe where nuclear technology has evolved for hundreds of years beyond our own day. And I bet that when the bombs dropped, both the Chinese and the United States used atomic bombs that we could not even imagine today. That may be the only explanation why the nuclear holocaust was as devastating for America as it was. Next, we'll go to Pilgrim's Landing, where we find an interesting location, but first let's head out to sea to see if we can find any more of those buoys. And by the time I'm done with this series, we'll have found every buoy in Point Lookout. And sure enough, south of the main docks, we find two floating buoys. At the bottom of the seafloor beneath the easternmost buoy, we find a skeleton lying on top of a gun cabinet. It's locked with an easy lock, and inside we find a sniper rifle. There are a few other boxes, and one very easy locked personal footlocker here. Inside the footlocker we find a power fist and some scotch, and then we can find a first aid kit. Swimming northwest of this buoy, we find another one. Beneath it, we find a lawnmower, a statue with its feet stuck in the ground, and a mini nuke lying on the floor inside of a little box. Here we also find an average locked safe, and inside we find some psycho, two stealth boys, and a small stash of bottle caps. There's a personal Foot locker nearby, and we see even more of these statues. Bethesda did this again in Fallout 4. When I did my video on what we find on the ocean floor of Fallout 4, we found an entire ship filled with these mannequins. Near to one final mannequin, we find a stash of three ammunition boxes, two of which were locked with very easy locks. When done, we can swim on over to Pilgrim's Landing. We've already explored everything interesting here, except for one location. On the eastern outside edge of Pilgrim's Landing, we find a little corner with some baby carriages set outside. We can clearly see that in one of these carriages, there's a rigged explosive, but at the time of this recording, my explosive skill was not high enough to disable it. Now there is a glitch here. I'm going to rewind that and play it again. Look at the sky, and then watch this thing explode again. Did you see that appear above the ferris wheel? This is a known glitch that has been reported on all platforms. If you allow this cart to explode, the cart appears floating in the sky, and there's no way to get rid of it outside console commands. We can now walk through a door to a warehouse. And oh my god, look at this. Perhaps this is the source of all of the dismembered doll heads we've seen all over Point Lookout. And look at all of these baby carriages. What on earth were they used for? Of course, we know that there will be some rigged ones. <laughs> and when they explode, looting becomes much harder. There's some buff out in a box to the northeast. Another rigged baby carriage to the south. A first aid kit on the southwestern wall. And then I really wanted to get to that back shelving area without triggering any of these traps. So hugging the wall to the south, we can turn west, walk around the perimeter of the room, and then reach the back. On the shelf, we find some 308 caliber rounds, a mini nuke, a box with some buff out inside, and a huge stack of missiles directly beneath an ammunition box filled with flamer fuel. There is one more ammunition box with more missiles, and as we loot it, we trigger the last two baby carriages. Well, I think that's all of them, and that's the end to the warehouse. We find another trap when we exit. There's a big delivery truck outside with a ramp, and when we try to walk up the ramp... Someone had placed proximity mines beneath the boards. There was no way to even see them until we walked up. But it's worth it. In the back, we find a huge stash of stim packs and three ammo containers. We likely stumble upon the next location as we leave the Sacred Bog. Walking southwest of the Sacred Bog, we see a rickety bridge leading to some sort of homestead. At the homestead, we find a bunch of swamp people. We have found some sort of farm called the Grower's Shack. Here we see a whole bunch of wild punga fruit growing, a great place to visit when trying to make some moonshine for Marguerite. There's a big water tower outside that we can drink from, but it does give us rads. And on the western side of the building, we find a door to the rundown shack. Inside, we find one enemy. Well, 
Well, we have just made an absolute mess of this bathroom. There's no loot in this bathroom aside from what's on his corpse. Heading out, we find ourselves in the living room. We see a police hat on a TV, possibly telling us that an officer used to live here. The kitchen and dining room is one big room. There's some Nuka-Cola in the refrigerator. And we can enjoy one of the unique looting opportunities of this DLC, these brand new kitchen cabinets, which strangely aren't as common as you'd think. I've only found them in a handful of the buildings we find here. In the bottom of one of the cabinets, we see a pot filled with caps. In the cabinet above the stove, we find some buff out. There's moonshine on a table. And in the master bedroom to the north, where we find a skeleton lying in bed. Possibly the pre-war skeleton of that police officer. The suitcase next to his bed is empty, but we do find a trunk to the west. There's minor loot inside, but just outside, we find some 10 millimeter rounds and a pistol. There's a mini nuke on the bedside table and a hollow tape. Box 1213, Burns voice. Don't tell Evelyn. The password? Buttercup. Why? Curious that this is a woman's voice. The holotape says Burn's voice. Is this woman's name Burn? And who exactly was Evelyn? I'm having a hard time what the password is a reference to. That why at the end is confusing me. It may be a reference to the song Build Me Up Buttercup by the Foundations, or perhaps a reference to Princess Buttercup and the Princess Bride. Though again, I can't explain why she ends with why. At any rate, after everything we've done for the Velvet Curtain, we know exactly what to do with this. Heading back to the People's Bank, we can play the holotape in front of the speaker. Don't tell Evelyn. The password? Buttercup. Why? Processing. Processing. Voice ID confirmed. Access granted. Inside, we just find pre-war money and some sexy sleepwear. Perplexing. Next, we head to the near middle of the map, close to mud hole number two, which we visited during the quest in Antique Land. Here we find the Little Tyke Playhouse, and it is inhabited by more swamp folk. We see that the Little Tyke Playhouse is a small playground, the prominent feature being a little red rocket. There's a swing set just outside the playhouse part of this playground. Perhaps the swamp folk had used it as a makeshift shelter. We find some makeshift bedding inside, and some playthings likely left over from the war, including a teddy bear, toy cars, blocks, and a chessboard. There is one skeleton lying in the Playhouse. Next to the playhouse, we find a red racer jumpsuit on an ironing board. There's a red ball and a tricycle outside, and more disturbingly, a big pile of toxic barrels in the water, right next to this little playground. Nearby, we find the ruin of a shack with two cars, maybe an adjacent preschool. Inside, we find a bed, but no loot. The Little Tyke Playhouse may be a reference to the real-world company called Little Tykes. They've been making children's playground equipment since 1969. To find the next site, we head northwest of Marguerite's shack or southwest of the Turtle Dove Detention Camp. We'll likely stumble upon this site as we leave the sewer to the Turtle Dove Detention Camp. This is the Trash Heap. The greatest and most prominent piece of loot we find here is an open safe in the middle of the heap where we can find a mini nuke, pre war money, and bottle caps. But if we are industrious, we can also walk away with a bag of yeast, some darts spread between two ammo containers. We find a hard-locked safe here, which has a tidy stash of caps and chems. That's all the loot we find here, but there are a few more things to point out. If we walk east of here, we see a bridge made from coffins. And of course, surrounding these coffins is a whole bunch of brain fungus. Remember, brain fungus likes to grow among decayed organic material. I think the only way we can explain these coffins is that they may have been what the pre-war Confederate soldiers were buried in before the Union ran out and began dumping them in mass graves. They certainly didn't come from the Turtle Dove detention camp because we know what they did to corpses there. Nearby, we find two shallow graves in one, we of course find a confederate hat, some human flesh, and some shotgun shells. And in the next, another confederate hat and more shotgun shells. We find this next site west of Pilgrim's Landing and just north of the Disaster Relief Outpost, which we'll cover in tomorrow's episode. We find another graveyard swarming with feral ghouls. This is the Ophi clan plot, presumably a private burial plot for the Ophi family. We can't dig up any of these graves. Perhaps the coffins have long ago fallen into the chambers underneath, but we do see that one grave has recently been exhumed. 
We see shovels and bottles of scotch just outside, and inside the coffin, we see a skeleton sitting up, and around this skeleton, children's toys, a teddy bear. And then as we look deeper, we see a car, a leg brace, and boxes of Salisbury steak. I'm thinking this must be the remains of a child. A crippled child at that. For some reason, he died and they buried him with his favorite things, his favorite toys, and his favorite boxes of frozen Salisbury steak. I typically take teddy bears for Marie at this juncture, but it just didn't feel right to take this bear from this child. Our next location is close to this one. If we travel southwest from the Ophi family plot towards the water, we see a little delta of some sort and a duck swarming with all sorts of critters. The Mirelurks are attacking the bloatflies. On the dock, we see one skeleton. He lies on the ground next to a bunch of irradiated barrels. There's a first aid kit by him and a big crate of beer, but that's about it. Walking just northeast of this location, we see some sort of obelisk. Near to the obelisk is the remains of a campfire. And close by, we find an inscribed plaque. Here marks the landing site of Captain John Smith's shallop upon his discovery of Point Lookout in 1612. <laughs> uh, this date is actually wrong. John Smith first came ashore here at Point Lookout in 1608, not 1612. In fact, he wasn't even in the Americas in 1612. In 1609, just a year after discovering Point Lookout, he was severely wounded when gunpowder accidentally went off in the canoe he was riding in, which forced him to head back to England to receive treatment. He didn't return to the Americas until 1614, where he sailed to the coasts of Maine and Massachusetts Bay. That was his last voyage to the New World. He returned back to England in 1615 after being kidnapped by French pirates and escaping, and he stayed in England for the rest of his life until his death in 1631. So this is a pretty big error for them to make right here, unless the divergence happened much earlier than we thought, changing the timeline of John Smith's achievements. Southwest of here, we can explore this little delta area. We see that the river has formed a bunch of sand mounds that rise above the water. On one, we find a loose pile of dirt. If we have a shovel in our inventory, we can excavate it, but we don't find anything inside. Moving on to the next mound, we find another pile, but near to this one is a shovel, a skeleton, and a holotape for Oswaldo. Oswaldo. The footlocker is buried on the island with a single tree in Dove Delta. Be careful, I peppered the area with a bunch of fake mounds just in case the Hughes gang finds this location. Regards, Benny. Well, looks like poor Oswaldo here either died to the Hughes gang or to the local fauna before he could excavate the appropriate hole. Scanning the delta, we easily spot the one mound with a tree. But heading on over, I had a really hard time finding this mound. I scanned each and every corner of the thing, finally finding the mound on the southern side near to the tree. Inside, we find a footlocker, and in the footlocker, a small stash of pre-war money and some shotgun shells. There's another buoy near to Dove Delta. Swimming out to sea, we can dive on down, where we see a huge pile of radioactive barrels. We find a shipwreck nearby, and inside the wreckage, we see an easy locked floor safe near to a bunch of skeletons. But inside, we just find some ammunition, caps, and a stealth boy. Our next location is really close to the grower's shack. If we head northeast of the grower's shack, we see a little trailer right on the water. The trailer is guarded by a bunch of swamp folk. <laughs> As we get close to the trailer, we see that we've discovered the flooded sinkhole. The trailer has a bed and a couple of containers, and there are some containers on the dock, but what's immediately interesting is the large quantity of junk floating in the middle of this pond. When we swim on out, we see that it's a whole bunch of stuff. Boxes, tin cans, bottles, teddy bears. There's even a garden gnome floating in a box like a boat. I found it easier to observe and loot these items when looking at them from underneath. But looking down, we see that this hole is extremely deep. 
diving down to the floor beneath us, we find a whole bunch of containers. We can loot a first aid kit, then an average locked safe. Inside we find some caps and whiskey, and then we need to rise for some air. We saw some bottles floating to the surface. We'll have to check out the junk pile after looting these containers to see if anything new floated up. Heading back down, we find an easy locked safe with more ammunition and scotch inside, right next to a very easy locked safe with 44 Magnum ammunition inside. There's a skeleton near to a boat, a big rusting wrecked car, another skeleton near to one of the safes, and that's about it. We notice that one of the bottles that floated up to the surface is a Nuka-Cola Quantum. There are two total. I'm thinking this must be a scripted event. As soon as we dive, something releases the bottles and they float up on top. Our next spot is just north of the sinkhole. We find another shack off in the distance, guarded by more swamp folk. The unique thing about this place is the outside is guarded by bear traps. We saw those swamp people walking around. They must have been very careful and more intelligent than we give them credit for to be able to avoid all of these traps. We also find a pressure plate trap surrounded by all sorts of meat. This is a great place to get some experience disarming all of these traps. I probably disarmed 20 or more in the course of exploring the grounds. Once we're satisfied that we've disarmed all of the traps, we can walk onto the deck to loot some shotgun shells on a table and then open the door to Trapper's Shack. Inside, we see a bloody mess. There's a mole rat skin on the ground, surrounded by blood. Blood on the walls. A skeleton in a cage to the northwest, with more blood around the walls. Corpses on the couch. Corpses in the kitchen. And then we hear it. You lost! <laughs> Is this the kind of environment that poor Kenny was raised in? I'm surprised he ended up as normal as he did. Above the oven, we find more of those cabinets. <laughs> one with a tin can trap inside and one. Ah! With a frag grenade trap inside. Walking east, we see why this is called the Trapper's Shack. These swamp folk were trapping animals, trapping people, trapping anything they could get their hands on. We see bloody axes, doses of jet, more pools of blood on the ground, and oh, look at this place. We see a room filled with totems made from bone, with more blood spatter all over the walls. There's some 10mm rounds on the ground next to a makeshift bed, and a stealth boy on a nearby cabinet next to some moonshine. In the bathroom, we see a bunch of empty and full bottles of whiskey and beer, and more blood and chunks of gore laid out. Leaving the trapper shack, we can walk around behind it, where we find a door to the cellar. And as soon as we arrive... Ah! found feral ghouls and a swamp lurk queen, but they were behind bars? What on earth was going on here? And then we see it lying on a table in the middle of the room is an electrical switch. Ow. Oh. And it operates the doors. Okay, I see what they were doing here. Well, I'd like to enjoy this experience as it was intended, so reloading my autosave, we can try this again. And it looks like the feral ghouls have some problems getting through the door. Instead of charging the swamp lurk together, they file in one by one. And my goodness, they are no match for this swamp lurk queen. The feral's dead, we've got to take out the swamp lurk. So this is what the swamp folk do for entertainment. They trap ghouls and swamp lurks and set up these cage fights. Oh, and look, they even take bets on the table we see a whole bunch of bottle caps and some Meyer Lurk cakes. In the southern corner of the shack, we find their workshop. Oh, and their larder. Look at this. A death claw hand sticks out of a freezer cabinet. Where did they get this? We haven't seen any death claw in Point Lookout. Beneath the death claw hand is a large stack of mole rat meat, dog meat, and a strange meat pie. The only other strange meat pie we can get in the game is at Andale. Which of course means that this strange meat pie is made from human. We see blood smeared on the ground leading to a nearby cabinet, but inside we just find some random scrap. That was a little disappointing. I was expecting more gore. 
In a nearby cabinet, we see some rad scorpion glands, hatchling mirelurk meat, mirelurk egg clutches. Looks like they were thinking of breeding mirelurks here. And then on the workbench to the east, a lever action rifle. On the shelf directly above, we find some rad X, a big stack of 10 millimeter rounds, some shotgun shells, and some frag mines. And then looting some shotgun shells on the very easy locked cabinet, we find some more 10 millimeter rounds. Next, we can pick the average locked cell door and loot the feral ghoul bodies. Inside the Myrler cage, we see that the queen had made some sort of Myrler nest. There's a lot of bones and goo in the corner with two safes, one larger than the other. After looting some pre-war money against the wall, we can unlock the bottom easy locked safe. Inside, we find a large stash, caps, ammo, and chems. On top of this safe is a slightly smaller, very easy locked safe. Inside this one is a much larger stash of caps and more ammunition and more chems. And on top of this safe, is a teeny tiny Nuka-Cola quantum bottle, a very unique item. We can either turn this into Sierra Petrovita, or since it's so unique, save it as a decoration for our player home. Next to this was a big stash of pre-war money. As soon as we leave the basement, we get rushed by Swamp Folk. Once dead, we can move on to the final location. This next location is an unmarked location. If we head to the point on the map furthest to the northwest, we find a swampy area swarming with feral ghouls. We then see a river that flows off to the west into a rocky hillside. And at the end of the river, what's that? Is that a, is that a Yaogwai? I think this is the first and only Yaogwai I've seen here in Point Lookout. As we creep forward, it catches scent of us and begins to attack. So before it can, we can take it out from a distance. As we get closer, we see that this bear was named Ruska? Wait, 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 wait a minute. Ruska? Ruska? Is this the same Ruska whose name we see plastered on those posters we find all over Point Lookout? On the very posters we found on the Duchess Gambit, on the very posters we found in Kenny's Cave. I've long said that these posters must have been promoting a pre-war circus and that Ruska was some sort of famed circus bear. And sure enough, in this little den, we see a big orange ball. Just like the ball, Ruska was depicted playing with in those posters. That can only mean one thing. We just killed a 200-year-old ghoulified circus bear. Oh, oh, I feel horrible. But this opens up a Pandora's box of possibilities. It means that humans are not the only mammals that can go ghoul. This suddenly makes the rumors of the ghoul whale from Fallout 4 that much more credible. Although I think they were probably referring to a submarine. It's also possible that this bear wasn't a ghoul at all, but simply acquired a longer lifespan after mutating. The radiation, of course, caused it to mutate into a Yaogwai, and I don't think any studies have been done about the lifespan of a Yaogwai in the wild. We certainly don't see any remains of Yaogwai who died from natural causes. But poor old Ruska, this bear has been sitting here doing Point Lookout a service, eating ghouls and swamp people and smugglers, and then we had to come along and kill it. <sighs> now you may not have found Ruska in your gameplay because Ruska is bugged. I had to revisit this location a dozen times before I found her. The reason is because she's programmed to appear on the other side of the rocks. Here I am the first time I explored this location, and I couldn't find Ruska anywhere, so I started to climb on the rocks. You can clearly hear the bear breathing on the other side of the rocks. In my frustration, I used console commands to drag the bear out from hiding, and then I watched it. I watched it walk all the way to the edge of the world, walk past the barrier towards the other side of the rocks. I couldn't follow him. 
So this is truly a Bethesda bug. The bear is programmed to spawn behind some rocks. We're only able to encounter him if he glitches to the other side of those rocks, which incidentally I was able to get him to do simply by visiting and revisiting the location a dozen or so times. I ended up not having to use console commands to get him to appear. And with that, we have visited every single marked minor location and some unmarked locations in Point Lookout. That leaves only one thing left to do. In tomorrow's video, we will finally confront the reclusive hermit Obadiah living in Blackhall Manor. I publish a new Fallout video six days a week on a wide range of topics spanning all of the games. I'm finishing up Point Lookout for the next few days, and if you want to make sure you don't miss the next episode in this series, be sure to subscribe and to click that bell notification button. Follow me on Twitter and Facebook if you want to keep up to date with all Oxhorn news. And if you like what I do and you want to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming one of my patrons on Patreon. But more than anything, I'm just so glad you're here watching this video with me today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you tomorrow morning, bright and early, with a brand new episode.